Welcome to the first episode of Payment Integrity Insights from Cotivity, where we explore best practices in improving payment integrity for health plans. My name is Brett Arnold, SVP of Product at Cotivity, and I am joined today by two of my colleagues, Alan Sullivan, Vice President and Senior Client Engagement Lead, and Jay Delarosa, Vice President of Prospective Payment Integrity. Our topic today is best practices in payment integrity for ASO employer groups. Alan, first things first, would you define for us what we mean by ASO? Hi, Brett. Yeah, absolutely. ASO, self-funded and self-insured are all used more or less interchangeably. Essentially, what it means is that an employer is able to act as his own insurer, taking on most or all of the risk associated with the claims and medical benefits for their employees. The insurance company is therefore acting as an administering plan or a TPA on behalf of the employer group. An employer does have to qualify under ERISA laws to be able to act as an ASO, so not all groups will be able to serve as their own risk-bearing entity. Got it. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about the scale here. Uh, we know that more and more members are being covered by self-funded groups. Alan, what does the data look like? Well, it is more ASO than you would expect. So about 65% of all members belong to an ASO group. When you look at large groups and extremely large groups, such as jumbo groups like American Airlines or Amazon, you're, you're up to about 82% of membership in those large groups that are covered by this type of an ASO arrangement. In addition to that, medical costs are increasing about 5.5% on average across the self-funded groups versus only 3% when you're looking at the fully insured commercial population. Got it. Jay, uh, do you have anything to add from your health plan experience? Yeah, thanks, Brett. Um, so I completely agree. I think more and more self-funded groups uh, were predominant. We saw it play out in the more than 10 years that I was at a health plan where when I started, the commercial split was closer to 50-50. And by the time I left, it was closer to 80-20. Excellent. Thanks, Jay. So healthcare is getting more expensive. We've all heard about that. And frankly, we've all felt that in our own home as healthcare costs increase. Um, so let's talk about employer groups. How are those healthcare cost increases affecting employer groups? And how much do the network discounts that payers are getting them help? According to PricewaterhouseCoopers, the consulting firm, our healthcare costs are going to balloon up to about 7% next year. And this is related to labor shortages, drug price increases, um, and just contract renewals with, with the providers. So the network is just getting more expensive as a result of some of those, those contract renewals. Another source, um, Center for American Progress and Kaiser Family Foundation have also given quotes that, that are anticipating that the premiums that we pay as members are anticipated to rise um, over the next five years, um, about 13% for the fully insured book of business and about 18% um, for these self-funded employer groups, um, which is really telling you that these employer groups, while they are their own risk-bearing entities, are struggling much more to maintain their healthcare costs and really try to realize more savings over time as compared to their fully insured counterparts. And the competitive environment is really changing for payers. It goes beyond discounted rates with their contracted providers. Payers must really ensure that their claims paid to providers from employer group also meet payment criteria and are not overpaid. That makes sense. And some recent news tells us that the stakes are raising for health plans and managing these costs. Um, can you tell us more? Well, one item that's been in the news quite a lot lately is that the employers are now looking at the health plan's fiduciary responsibility um, when these ASO groups or these large employers um, are signing up for a particular health plan to uh, administer their claims. And so what that means is that basically the health plan is not using the same processes, they're not using the same vendors, they're not using the same cost-saving mechanisms with their fully insured business and their ASO business. 
and therefore they're realizing more savings on their fully insured book of business. And now these large employer groups are saying, why is that? There really needs to be some parity and the health plan should use as much diligence in their cost savings programs on the ASO groups just as they are in the, the fully insured realm. At my plan, we treated our ASO claims as if fully insured, even if uh, they didn't necessarily go live at the same time. Uh, they tend to closely lag behind our fully insured business. We felt strongly from the provider experience standpoint that they should be the same. Providers don't know the funding source, so when they get disparate results on members with the exact same claim codes, it's a bit confusing for them. Um, so we tried to edit all of our claims, whether they were ASO, fully insured, home host, uh, all the same. We also had ASO clients that would contract with third-party vendors to audit our claims and essentially grade our PA capabilities. At renewals, these audits were material and they became part of the negotiating strategy on behalf of the groups. So a strong PI program was critical to us maintaining competitiveness in the market. Gotcha. That makes sense. That consistency really does sound like it would help with the experience in the employer groups. So we're talking about healthcare costs here and the challenge is big and getting bigger. And and from Alan, we know the lawyers are now getting involved. So um, let's move from the problem statement to focus on how we can help. Uh, so at Cotivity, we work with all the top 25 health plans in the United States, including 96% of all blues. Um, of our clients with self funded group business, about three quarters are editing those claims using our second pass editing solution payment policy management. That includes 90% of the large nationals and about three quarters of the blue plan clients. Of those, nearly all are going to step further with a human coding validation review as well. So in implementing and operating with those clients, we've learned some best practices to support employer groups along the way. Um, first and foremost, you need to have sponsorship at an executive level and strong support from the payment integrity leadership team. In addition to that, this is a really a cross business unit problem, a cross departmental problem where you need to involve group sales, legal, product, the technology team. So it really becomes an interdisciplinary cross department function to execute payment integrity. So let's get more into detail from our experts. Uh, let's start with some of our learnings about product design and contracting at health plans. And Alan, where do you advise your clients to start with payment integrity for ASO groups? Well, first and foremost, the health plan needs to look at and, and confer with legal and determine whether they already have an opt-in versus an opt-out strategy. Opt-in means that you're offering sort of a, an a la carte menu, if you will, to your employer group and letting them choose which of the program integrity functions or really any of the, the health plan functions and have the health plan really administer them. But they are giving carte blanche to the employer group to say which of the options on the menu that they want to select. So while that sounds great and sounds like the employer group has a lot more control, it actually really puts a, a very large burden, not only on the ASO group, but also on the health plan themselves and being educated and being able to speak to all of their um, employer groups and educating really their group sales division on all of these different types of products and being able to really quote unquote sell hard sell those types of things to the ASO groups. And therein lies some of the problem when you're talking about some of those lawsuits that we mentioned earlier with respect to the fiduciary responsibility. The contrast to that is called an opt out. And what that means is that the health plan has really vetted these vendors, these programs, both prospectively as well as retrospective payments, um, meaning before the claim is paid versus a recovery after the, the claim has already paid. And they have already vetted all of these vendors and all of these programs. And they said, this is this is our best practice. This is what we recommend. And therefore, employer group, you're going to be enrolled in all of these things by signing up with us, as opposed to having to go through and sell each one from an a la carte fashion. So it does a few things. Number one, it, is, it really um, simplifies um, the, the group sales process. It maximizes the savings for those employer groups. It really has a much faster ramp up time because you're not doing a lot of 
customization. You're not really having to go back and forth from a negotiation perspective with those employer groups. And really a, a very important benefit to both the members within those groups as well as to the health plan is really driving some of that um, provider continuity um, that Jay mentioned a little bit earlier. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. So it sounds like this opt-out approach is simpler, faster, and ends up with a more consistent uh, program for providers. Um, let's go a little deeper. Um, what are some other group contracting best practices? So as with any contract, you want consistent language, you want to be careful with performance guarantees, and you want to really develop a deployment timeline that, that works for everyone. Given my role at Cotivity, the value of payment integrity is clear to me. Uh, it reduces medical costs and helps members get more bang for their buck or really more services for their premium dollars spent on insurance. However, employer groups expect plans to pay claims correctly as part of their service, so it may take some convincing to get them to pay extra for payment integrity. Jay, what have you found that could help health plans, payment integrity leaders engage their employer groups? Yeah, thanks, Brett. So I can't stress enough the importance of a strong PI program within a plan. It's critical to a plan success. Uh, I'm likely preaching to the choir here. <laughs> um, it makes healthcare more affordable for everyone. So keeping medical costs down and members premium down is, uh, is again, a primary role of a, of a plan. Money saved on inappropriate medical spend can be spent on, on other things that are relevant to the plan, whether it's wellness services or, or again, uh, reducing premium dollars, right? Uh, better health care contributes to uh, better work-life balance and, and, again, just satisfaction overall, especially with ASO groups where employers want their employees to be healthy uh, and productive uh, at their jobs. Uh, so avoiding any incorrect medical spend means less out-of-pocket costs for employees, uh, because copays are typically calculated on what is allowed and what is not billed. Uh, and so allowing these types of PI programs to fully be engaged uh, is critical to, again, to that um, uh, employee's bottom dollar. Um, unfortunately, you know, the American healthcare system is complicated. I know oftentimes I struggle uh, with my own EOBs and coverage and copays. Um, and, and consumers need to count on their healthcare partners to advocate on their behalf to avoid any so, sort of surprise billing, balance billing of members. And so this, uh, this is critical in, in my, my mind. One of the, the main questions that we get, certainly the most frequent question that we get, is why should I pay more for a particular payment integrity or payment accuracy program? that is not part of the standard offering that I get through my health plan. And we like to use the analogy, and it comes across very, very well because everybody is familiar with you have your primary care physician and you have a specialist. And when we're talking to these group sales folks and trying to help them understand the difference is we say, you know, you have some sort of an illness or maybe just a preventive care visit, or perhaps you know your child needs a physical for playing sports at school, you go to your primary care physician for that. They can take care of 95%, 98% of any problem, any need that you have from an overall medical needs um, perspective. That said, there are those 5% of the time, 3% of the time when you really need a specialist. It's something very complex. It's something that your primary care physician does not deal with on a daily basis. And so those are the types of things and really honestly for the same reason why these program integrity vendors exist. That is, they do something specialized that the health plans program and normal editing and clearinghouse edits don't do. And here at Cotivity, we have been doing this for a very, very long time, for decades. And that is we look for very complex scenarios. We look for very um, unique pricing arrangements on post-pay and contract compliance and a variety of other things that you can't do inside of the health plan or you may not be able to do certain things prepay, such as some of your contract compliance programs and your coordination of benefit programs. So there, there are a variety of different reasons why a payment accuracy program is important. 
And those are things that you really do want a specialist looking at um, to be able to really maximize those savings on behalf of the, the health plan and the employer group. Got it, Alan. Thanks. It makes sense. So um, so vendors like Cote when you're going deeper and finding more, um, and that provides more uh, medical cost savings to the employer groups. So go deeper, find more, um, and there's additional value there. So how about representing that value, that incremental value to groups? Um, uh, any more lessons on engaging groups with that value messaging? Yeah, so Alan made some great points, Brett. Uh, I would add that, you know, adjudicating benefits, uh, UM pricing is different from, uh, as Alan mentioned, the hundreds of payment rules that exist. Uh, I would often get uh, feedback from my healthcare partners uh, at the plan that we should not edit specific covered benefits, right? Whether it's behavioral health or uh, EPSDT, you know, things that were of high value to the plan. Um, I would counter that benefits still need to be billed appropriately. Um, I like to use hysterectomy as an example because it crosses a lot of different criteria, whether it's age, gender, laterality, et cetera. So although it may be a covered benefit, it shouldn't be done on an infant, for example. Uh, it shouldn't be done on a biological male or, or build with left, right, or bilateral modifiers, right? It shouldn't be billed more than once per lifetime. And so, so these are things that regardless of all the UM and again, all the adjudication that a plan does, uh, payment integrity is important to ensure that these types of scenarios don't increase costs for, for everyone. So you really have to separate the payment integrity function from the claims administrative services. Thanks, Jay. Um, it's clear that you've had the opportunity to explain payment integrity before <laughs> and you're an expert, um, but these health plans need to explain payment integrity to groups. And the folks at health plans that talk to groups are usually group sales. And group salespeople are unlikely to be as practiced at you <laughs> in telling this payment integrity story. Um, so payment integrity leaders will often step in at the health plan to help train and assist uh, group sales in large group conversations. And uh, important to note, payment integrity vendors like Otivity also often partner with those payment integrity clients at their health plans to help provide educational tools and support. So uh, once the groups are engaged, and especially when they're paying for payment integrity, but they're gonna wanna see the value they're receiving, right? So if you're paying for something, you wanna know what you're getting. Um, it's extremely important for plans to be able to share the value story with their self-funded groups. Alan, how do we see our clients reporting value to their employer groups? Well, um, Jay hit the nail on the head a little bit earlier in our conversation, and that is uh, reporting is a very, very large component um, of really selling that value story. We heard that from numerous of our clients at the, um, the Cotivity Conference this year, and uh, it really drove home the need for more reporting and more robust reporting to be able to facilitate those conversations. So um, having both summary and detail level reporting um, for the groups is obviously um, critical being able to break down where those savings are coming from. So being able to share what some of those medical cost categories are that are contributing um, to the savings and, and the medical expense overall has been an area that's been beneficial in helping to educate our health plan clients and then in turn helping for them to communicate that value to the employer groups. All right, I'm not a pilot. Um, from what I've heard, the trickiest parts of any flight are the takeoff and the landing. For payment integrity, getting off the ground starts with an implementation project. Alan, what lessons have we learned in implementing new payment integrity programs for health plans ASO business? I would say the very most important item to consider is uh, your strategic vision. Be strategic, map it out. What is your multi-year plan? What is your end game in terms of deployment of these PI programs across your group? There are multiple vendors, there are multiple programs inside of a single vendor. Um, Contivity, for example, has a whole suite of program integrity products um, to bring additional value at different intervention points for these employer groups. And so be strategic and really take your time to plan that out. It will, over time, um, really help the health plan realize those savings in a more cost conscious way, as well as um, being able to bring that value uh, year over year to the employer groups. So for example, 
um, looking at implementation, do your, your homework, do your mapping for all of your employer groups, even if you happen to be an opt-in um, approach to selling these programs to your, your employer groups. What that means is you only have to map that data in one time um, and you don't have to, to open the hood of the car and continue to have to um, get in there and fiddle on a group by group basis every time some of your employer sales team goes out and sells these these different programs. Map everything in up front and make it configurable from a bypass perspective so that you can really limit those implementation costs. That's what we mean by being strategic um, and looking at that overall vision. Another one is consistency. We've talked about it a couple of times um, in this discussion, but really limit the modifications and customizations. Um, it's going to improve your overall administration costs associated with these programs, but it also is really important in terms of the provider experience. As Jay mentioned, the providers don't know whether a particular member presenting this health plan membership card, they, they have no idea whether they are a fully insured member or an ASO member. And so you really want their experience with those providers to be as consistent as possible. And one way to do that is to really limit the amount of customization in the different ways that these these programs are administered between your fully insured book of business and your ASO business. And then you want to really pay attention to that expansion plan. Obviously, you can certainly go big bang and do everything at once. Most of our clients don't do that. Uh, obviously, um, you have limitations on resources, on budget, and IT, and various things of that nature. And so you really um, want to look at the rollout plan and balance the complexity of an implementation, for example, with the value um, and the cost savings, and then be able to sort of phase things in over time to really build out that overall value proposition across the full suite of the different products and vendors that are in your ecosystem. Jay, what else would you add? Yeah, thanks, Alan. So completely agree with your comments on a strategic approach. Uh, having implemented several PI vendors on multiple platforms and lines of business, uh, I always try to uh, build for longevity, right? Uh, and uh, I, I was likely the outlier. Um, I like Big Bang. I uh, I wanted it all. <laughs> so what I would say is build once uh, and deploy with flexibility. Uh, give as much data as you can. Uh, that allows um, vendors to make configurations on their end by bypassing groups or opt out or things like that. But having the data in house uh, allows us to still provide plans with with very critical data to take back to their sales teams when it comes time to recontract. Um, establish a point of claim. I think tying the savings directly to a claim is uh, important for groups. Uh, so having that uh, line level detail is important. Uh, and then finally, plan for the future, right? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of activity in moving a lot of post-pay uh, PI programs into prepay. So updating your data feed to accommodate future payment integrity programs like prepayment DRG validation, prepayment coordination of benefits or coding validation would be critical to ensuring that we're able to accommodate and, and make your investment last as long as possible. Well, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Alan, for sharing your insights and experience with us today. Um, looking back, I think there's two big takeaways from my perspective. Um, first, partnering with your self-funded groups on payment integrity can significantly increase value and satisfaction for those group clients. And second, having the right information and the right processes is key to engaging your self-funded group partners in payment integrity programs. Thank you for listening to Payment Integrity Insights, a new podcast from Cotivity. I'm Brad Arnold, Senior Vice President of Product Development, and we've been joined today by Cotivity's Alan Sullivan, VP and Senior Client Engagement Lead, as well as Jay De La Rosa, VP of Prospective Payment Integrity. For more information, start the conversation with Cotivity today by visiting us at Cotivity.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon.